In this video, I hope to tackle some of the issues raised in the comments section of my previous video, which was about Apple Music's very leaky plumbing system when it comes to high-res audio and CD quality audio streams basically sent from their servers to our hi-fi system. Now that video is only, what, two days old? and it's already racked up well over 40,000 views. So thank you to everybody who watched that video, and thank you also to everybody who left a comment raising an important related issue, because it's into those related issues that I want to dig today. This episode is brought to you by Primair's new SPA25 Prisma, the home cinema integrated amplifier designed for both music and movies. Go to primair.net for more information. Welcome back everybody. Yes, Apple certainly doesn't make it easy for us to get CD quality and high res audio from its streaming service into our hi-fi system with loudspeakers or headphone systems. And today I want to add a few extra points of interest to the conversation before firmly drawing a line under this topic. And we'll start today with my nearly dead iPad. The battery no longer holds the charge for more than a couple of hours, but it's, you know, it's had a good run. I bought it back in 2014 for around 600 Australian dollars, and I want you to remember that number because we'll be coming back to it. Also impressive is that this iPad, I think it's an Air 2, received regular software updates from Apple right up until the battery's full demise last month. So that's almost 10 years of updates, and that's not bad at all, I don't think. So remember this as well, because we'll be coming back to that point as well later in this video. Now, one comment that continues to surface is how apparently we don't need to worry about Apple AirPlay when Bluetooth powered by Sony's LDAC codec running on an Android phone can handle high res audio carriage just fine. Now, as far as I can tell, that is flatly not true. LDAC will carry a high-res file over Bluetooth, but it can only do so by first discarding some audio data. Basically, it gets rid of the audio data that it thinks we won't notice. It's lossy compression, essentially. And therefore, that means it's not lossless. Now, per Sony's website explainer, LDAC isn't even lossless in its handling of CD quality audio. The only way to carry lossless CD quality over Bluetooth, certainly at time of taping, is to pair something like an iFi Neo IDSD2 DAC or the new Bose QC Ultra headphones with a smartphone that's equipped with Qualcomm's Snapdragon sound chipset and its Aptex lossless codec. And even with those bits of Bluetooth hardware in play, lossless high res remains very much, very much out of reach. Another common area of confusion relates to the Apple TV. I've seen some people assert in the comments of the last video that it sends high res audio out of its HDMI port and it doesn't. Well, not the high res that most audio files think of, like 2496 or 24192. Now, how do we know this? Well, firstly, Apple's website tells us that the Apple TV's high res support tops out at 48 kilohertz. And secondly, a quick dive into the music app settings on the Apple TV allows us to bump up the audio output from AAC 256 kilobits per second to Apple lossless, but only to 2448. This means anything higher will be downsampled to 48 kilohertz, which my MyTech DAC absolutely confirms. And that same DAC also tells me that CD quality streams from Apple Music are upsampled by the Apple TV to 48 kilohertz. So essentially, the Apple TV is not bit perfect. Now, personally, I don't mind because I'm not so much of a high-res enthusiast or a bit perfect diehard, but I can see how it might rub some audiophile idealists the wrong way.
What about Sonos devices? Well, they operate in a similar manner to the Apple TV, in that high-res support tops out at 48K on all of them, essentially, all the speakers, all the streamers, all the amps. And I don't think, though, that CD quality streams are upsampled to 48 kilohertz, but I could be wrong. If you've got a port and you've connected it to an external DAC, please let us know in the comments what it does to CD quality, because I don't know. But Sonos, essentially, is an important part of the Apple Music conversation, because it's the only company to be given permission by Apple to integrate Apple Music streaming into its app. And Sonos gets this special treatment because it's an enormously, enormously popular streaming platform. And the likes of Wim and Rune, much less so. If we consider this properly, I would say that Wim and Rune are essentially plankton to the Apple's blue whale. And this should really be all the explanation we need to understand why we won't see Apple Music integrated by Rune or Wim anytime soon, if ever. And the trick yet to be mastered by some audiophiles, I think, is to fully realize just how narrow our audiophile niche is. There have been some murmurings of late of Android 14 dispensing with the 48 kilohertz sample rate conversion. But first, we really have to ask, which smartphone models have received an Android 14 update already? Because at time of taping, I think it's really only the last few generations of Pixel devices, because early access to new OS releases is a Pixel privilege. Now, I own a Google Pixel 7 Pro, which recently received its Android 14 update. And that brings us to the next question. Does Android 14, as it currently stands, still resample all digital audio streams to 48 kilohertz? And the answer is, yes, it does, at least as far as I can tell with the dongle DACs that I connected to my phone yesterday and the day before. So whatever the Google engineers have in store for Android's SRC, it isn't with us yet. And I really don't know how long that's going to take to percolate through the sort of Android ecosystem, and especially with TVs, because TVs running Android also resample to 48K, and I don't know whether that new way of doing or new way of handling digital audio will make its way into TV OSs. And certainly, I don't think it's going to be in the next couple of years. I think we're going to have to wait a bit. Now, there are two caveats to this Android nonsense in that USB Audio Player Pro circumvents Android's SRC, but it doesn't integrate Apple Music and likely never will, and it doesn't let us offline any content. Now, Rune Arc, which I much prefer, when running on Android, optionally loads in its own USB driver for bit perfect playback between it and the USB DAC to which it's connected. But Rune doesn't integrate Apple Music either, and it probably never will. But for me, Arc's key advantages are its ability to offline content from local libraries, so the hard drive that I have in my kitchen. And I really like Rune Arc's fairly extensive new DSP feature set called Muse. The crossfeed settings for headphones inside Muse, for me, I find, yeah, they're extremely useful and extremely satisfying. Now let's go back to my iPad Air 2. Its settings panel tells me that it's running iPad OS 15.7.9. And that was an update released by Apple last month for older iPhones and older iPads. And Apple seems to really care about the long-term support of its devices. So now we have to ask, because I mentioned them extensively in my last video, for how long will the likes of Fio and Eversolo issue software updates for their Android-based network streamers. Because the R7 runs Android 10, and according to Fio, it does this because Android 10 comes tied by their supplier to the Snapdragon 660 SoC used inside the device. Now, unfortunately, Google ceased issuing security updates for Android 10 in March of this year. Now, the Android 11 running on the Eversolo is still being supported by Google, 
but we've got to ask again, like for how long? But we don't really need to ring the alarm bell just yet. An absence of security updates coming down the pipe to our devices doesn't render those devices unusable overnight, but it could, in time, open a security hole in your or my home network. But that, at this stage, is a maybe. And even if we do eventually decide to cut off the FIO or the EverSolo from the internet due to these security concerns, both units would still function as external DACs, and the FIO would also continue to operate as a file server thanks to its SD card slot on the back. And it's also a very powerful THX circuited headphone amplifier. And the FIO's headphone amplifier is one reason why I think it bests an iPad as a source for Apple Music. Which really brings me to my final point. And that is, I now have to buy a new iPad. And if I want one with USB-C to sidestep the lightning adapter, I'm looking at at least 450 bucks. If I then wanted to turn my new iPad into an Apple Music streaming source, I'd also probably need a USB-C dongle adapter to keep the iPad fed with power while simultaneously pulling digital audio from its USB socket, so from Apple Music and then out the USB socket. And that's another 10 bucks, not a deal breaker. But then I could add a iFi Zen 2 DAC for another 200, which would give me very decent DA conversion and balanced headphone drive, just like the FIO. But I'm still sure the SD card reader and the adapter cable needed to turn the iFi's 4.4 millimeter Pentacon socket into XLR connectors. The XLR connectors essentially that we find on the back of the FIO. Now a cable adapter like that from iFi would cost me another 100 bucks, which then pushes my spending well north of the R7's asking price. So my point is really that iPads and their accessories don't come for free. They cost money just like the FIO and the EverSolo. And yes, I can definitely appreciate the irony of my recommending Android devices to solve an Apple Music problem. Now lastly, the elephant in the room, one that I alluded to earlier, is that high-res audio doesn't sound night and day better than CD quality, it just doesn't. At least it doesn't to my ears with my gear. And as you know, I go through lots and lots of different and very expensive gear sometimes. And it seems to me that mastering quality impacts what we hear far more than the bit depth or the sample rate of the file that we're playing. But the numbers that tell us about the dynamic range of a recording aren't as accessible or as readily talked about by audiophiles as the likes of 24-bit 96 kilohertz or 24-bit 192 kilohertz. So, go figure. Anyway, if you like this follow-up video to my previous video, then please give us a like down below. If you like my attitude towards essentially going deep on Apple Music streams and all the ifs and the buts and the maybes or the gotchas that can catch you along the way and what we can do about that, then please consider subscribing to this channel. This will, as I said at the start of this video, be my last video on this topic. I've done it to death and I need to move on. So yeah, thank you ever so much for watching. Hello, it's me again. You're watching this video on YouTube, I would think. And if you are watching it on Patreon, you'd be seeing a slightly longer version with bloopers at the end of the video. And also you'll find on my Patreon playlists that cover off all of the music spoken about and heard in the interludes in every video. And we've got like three or four years worth of those now. So if you'll consider supporting me on Patreon, even if it is just for like a month or something, just to buy me a cup of coffee, that would be tremendous. Thank you very much.